Good morning, everyone. You're listening to The Sci-Files, an exposure segment featuring Michigan State University student research. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. Good morning, everyone. Daniel and I are here at Potter Park Zoo in Lansing, Michigan. At Potter Park, there is a pregnant black rhino named Dopsy. She's getting an ultrasound done today. Daniel and I are here to interview the students, zookeepers, and doctors that are working with Dopsy throughout her pregnancy. The students now will tell their side of the story. Hi, my name is Bridget Walker, and I'm a third year at the Michigan State University College of Veterinary Medicine. And this summer, I got to work with Dr. Ronan as his summer student, and I spent a lot of time over with Dopsy um, observing her ultrasounds, which are a special way that doctors can look and monitor pregnancies, and also helping out with her blood draws, which is a good way to track her hormones throughout her pregnancy. And these hormones are really important to a healthy pregnancy. And what is a hormone anyways? Um, A hormone is a special chemical in the body that organs use to talk to one another, and it helps to coordinate biological processes within the body. Like whenever a rhino gets pregnant. Like whenever a rhino gets pregnant. Mm -hmm. And what hormones are you focusing on specifically? The biggest focus for Dopsy's pregnancy has been the hormone progesterone. Progesterone is one of the biggest hormones in pregnancies, and it's absolutely essential to maintain the pregnancy for the right amount of time and ensure a healthy baby. How do you draw blood from a rhino safely without getting kicked by it, for example? Yeah, so that is something that takes a lot of teamwork. So the first step in getting an animal to voluntarily blood draw or an animal that lets you draw its blood while it's awake and it knows it's going on and it just lets it kind of happen comes from the zookeepers and the animal itself. So the zookeepers worked for months, for a really long time, to train Dopsy to stand still for blood draws and let herself be poked in the leg with a needle, which is something a lot of people don't even really like to sit still for. Um, But the zookeepers have her stand on a block with one leg, and it puts a lot of weight on her other leg and makes her vessels really stand out. And um, she does this for her favorite snacks. So she gets alfalfa cubes, sweet potato, carrot, romaine lettuce. Um, She works for a lot of different snacks. So she pretty much just stands there and gets snacks and gets one little poke in the leg, hopefully. Um, Sometimes it takes more than one poke in the leg. And so if she decides that she's done for the day or she doesn't really want to cooperate that day, she's in a chute and both ends of this chute are open. And so she can leave at any time and walk away. And once she walks away, if she doesn't want to come back, it's done for the day. And if we don't get a blood draw that day, we don't get a blood draw that day. And that's fine. And that choice that she has to walk back and forth and go away and maybe come back is really important because it keeps her really low stress. She never feels like she's trapped anywhere. She can go, she can go and come as she pleases. Thanks for that wonderful introduction about Dopsy, Bridget. Now we're here with a group from the Large Animal Clinical Rotations. Can you please introduce yourselves? So my name is Peter Fowler. I'm a fourth year vet student at the College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, We were given this opportunity. Um, We're real excited to see Dopsy. I've never actually um, been out here to see Dopsy before, and I know very little about rhinos. We cover a lot of animals through our veterinary education, but um, this is kind of a unique opportunity we're given right now. So I'm looking forward to seeing how an ultrasound is done on a pregnant rhino. Hi, my name is Sumana Prabhakar. Um, I'm a fourth year veterinary student as well on the large animal clinical rotation. I think the thing I'm most excited for today is, you know, we get to learn a lot about dogs and horses, kind of like what Peter said. And we do learn a lot about, you know, tracking pregnancy and tracking hormone levels that Bridget talked about in these animals. And I think we're really excited to see how they're going to translate that into a rhino. And it's going to be a really exciting way for us to compare our different species and hopefully also be able to apply it to other rhinos around the country as well. My name's Ashley Shoemaker. Um, I think that Michigan State University prepares us for a lot um, in our program at the College of Veterinary Medicine, but there's not a lot of information about exotic species, um, not a lot of information about our zoo species. Uh, We get the opportunity through different clubs and things to kind of delve into that if we're interested, but um, seeing this is a rare and unique opportunity, as as we've said before, 
And not only that, it it provides us the chance to learn more about animals in general, learn more about um, our large animal species, our cows, our horses, and compare between what we see here today, our zoo species, and what we'll see in the future, um, what we see every day um, over at the school. So it's a very unique opportunity. My name is Bethany Myers. I'm also a fourth year vet student at Michigan State. I think uh, today, just to reiterate what everybody else has said, it's a really big opportunity to get to see and work with a black rhino like Dopsy. Um, And it's also a really big learning opportunity for us to, you know, like they said, we're constantly comparing dogs and cats to cows and horses and what's similar and what's different. But we're also on a daily basis in our profession um, comparing those dogs and cats to ferrets and and other exotic animals so the same thing that you know we're doing on a daily basis these zoo veterinarians are doing um, in their lives and they say that it takes a village to raise a child but it clearly takes a profession as a whole to raise a rhino and so it is really cool to see how we're taking what what the world already knows and what we're learning from Dopsy um, and how to incorporate those to um, promote the species as a whole. Thank you all for those incredible introductions. What is a rotation anyways, Bethany? So that's a really good question. A lot of times as veterinary students, we get uh, asked what school looks like for us, how long we're in school. By the time we're done, are we real doctors? Um, So we take four years of undergrad to get a bachelor's, just like lots of other degrees do. Um, Whether that's a major in animal science, psychology, communication, we um, have students in our class who've been lawyers before, all different professions. Then after that, we're accepted into vet school, um, which they say is the hardest part, getting in, but we'll tell you that vet school is very hard anyway. (laughs) Vet school is typically a four-year program at Michigan State. The curriculum that um, the five of us here have completed or will complete um, is two and a half years of didactic learning or learning that we do in a classroom Um, We have lectures, we have exams, we also have various labs that we do to have hands-on experiences. Um, After those two and a half years, um, we've had or will have a year and a half of clinical rotations. Those, for us at Michigan State University, are three-week-long blocks where we'll rotate between different aspects of veterinary medicine. So we have some, we have a block for cardiology, We have a block for emergency services and small animal. We have the large animal block that the four of us are on right now. Um, And so we'll rotate through various rotations um, within the veterinary teaching hospital itself at Michigan State University. And then we also have the opportunity to do various externships or rotations outside of the teaching hospital um, so that we can better prepare ourselves in areas of the field that we don't necessarily get exposure to. Sumana, what can you learn from your clinical rotations versus your classroom settings? So I think one of the most important things we get in our clinical rotation is, you know, we we go through about two and a half years of getting to see professors and people who are really knowledgeable in their field present information, but then we actually get to see those animals and see how they present to us Um, in the hospital setting. So as students, we're able to, um, for starters, take in a good history, actually do the physical exam on these patients, and then get to converse with a clinician who's very knowledgeable in whichever rotation we're going through um, and, you know, get their opinion on it as well as it kind of opens up a whole discourse on how we're feeling about that case and how we want to treat it. So when we kind of talk about Dobsy, I think one of the really important things is we get to um, really see how we can examine these patients and get to put our hands on them and the different things we feel and compare it to some of our other species as well. When I hear an ultrasound, I often think about when a pregnant woman goes to a a clinical setting and they get that gel rubbed over their belly and then they rub the uh, device to see the fetus inside of the woman. What does it look like to perform an ultrasound with a rhino? 
So a lot of it looks the same, just on a lot bigger scale. So we have a special ultrasound probe, which is that device that they use to contact the belly um, for Dopsy that reaches further because she's a rhino. She's really, really big. And so these ultrasound probes emit a sound wave that we can't hear, but it bounces and interacts with these tissues. It bounces back, and that's transmitted to an image on a screen. And so that's how an ultrasound works. And so this special probe is made to go deeper into tissues um, and deeper into space. So we get a good picture of hopefully baby rhino. So that's something that we really want to see today. We've seen the baby rhino on ultrasounds before, and one of the zookeepers actually got a video of the baby kicking from inside of Dopsy. Um, So that's on Facebook if anybody wants to go check it out. It's really cool. Um, So today, right, we're just going to be looking for a healthy baby. Hopefully it'll go floating by at some point because she's a big lady. Dopsy's big. Um, So it can be difficult to find the baby sometimes. But we know it's in there somewhere. I would imagine a rhino has much thicker skin than a human female. What kind of machine goes into this like how strong does the machine have to be for a rhino versus for a human and do they still put it on the outside or do they need to go inside of her to do this ultrasound so the machine itself isn't necessarily different um it's the probe that's a little bit different and there's different shapes of probes and there's different um amounts of energy that these probes emit so dopsy's probe that we have for her goes further but it doesn't give us quite as good of resolution so the picture might be a little bit fuzzier but we know we're looking deeper into dopsy Um, and so there are two different ways that we ultrasound dopsy we do what's called a trans abdominal which is outside just like you would do on a human and then we also do trans rectal which is where you put on a plastic sleeve up to your shoulder with the ultrasound probe and you go through her rectum to look at her uterus and to look at the baby Um, So that might be a little bit disconcerting to humans because that's definitely not something that happens in human practice. But for large animal medicine, which is the closest we can get to rhino medicine, uh, that's a really common practice. It's something that's done on these animals and there are some risks with it, but generally it's pretty safe. I would imagine it's safe for the rhino, but what about the human? Like, How does a rhino react to a transrectal ultrasound? So that's something that, again, the zookeepers have worked really hard to get Dopsy to train for. She will stand for it awake. She's a really, really good rhino. So there are days where she decides she's not feeling it and she's going to walk away and doesn't want to deal with it. Uh, But for the most part, she's pretty well-mannered and she'll just stand and let it happen for snacks. Thank you to all the students that gave us their input on their experiences in the vet med program. Now we're here with the doctors. We're here with Dr. Strakota, Dr. Carlton, and Dr. Ronan. Dr. Strakota, can you please tell us a little bit about your experience with this? I saw you over there with Dopsy conducting the ultrasound. What is your role in this? So I am actually a non-traditional resident at Michigan State University. And so I um, am, my mentor is actually Dr. Carlton and Dr. Roberts. And so I'm here just learning as well. Um, And so I'm learning about the black rhino, about different things like placentation, which means their placenta and what type of placenta they have. And just we're trying to learn more about what the pregnancy in the black rhino is like. And we're able to do that because Dopsy is so willing to be an active participant. Throughout Dopsy's pregnancy, what experiences and skills have you gained and learned? Yeah, so for me, I um, have had the opportunity to transrectally and transabdominally ultrasound her and to get an idea of actually what her uterine horns look like, so the anatomy of her uterus. Um, We've also been able to see things on transabdominal ultrasound, like parts of her placenta, like the amnion. It's the one thing you heard us say today, um, that we could see glimmers of that. Um, And so those are things that we've learned along with just um, interacting with Dopsy. What is an amnion, and what is the advantage of doing a transrectal versus a transabdominal ultrasound? An amnion is part of the placenta. It's the part that surrounds the actual fetus. And so um, we're just looking at that as a a marker so you can look at the difference in the fluid within the actual amnion versus surrounding the coriolantoas and to make sure that the pregnancy looks healthy, that we don't have concerns that there's an infection, um, thickness within that tissue, those are things that we're looking for. 
initially early in the pregnancy, if we were to look at her pregnancy transabdominally, we wouldn't see anything because that pregnancy isn't far enough along in gestation. And so that little embryo then becomes a fetus, right, as we get organ development. And so initially transrectally was the only way that we could see her pregnancy. Then eventually we could see it transabdominally, and that's when it has become more exciting because we actually can see the fetus. We can see bony structures. Um, and so you get information about um, the pregnancy from both routes. Like you saw today, eventually we should be able to see her fetus up in her pelvic canal, and then we know that it's in position for parturition. And by parturition, you mean giving birth in layman's terms, right? Yep, so parturition is the active part. It's There's three parts to parturition, um, but it will actually be active labor in the fetus coming through the pelvic canal. Since we're in the latter stages of Dopsy's pregnancy, when is she expected to be due? So Dopsy is expected to be due on December 25th, but the thing to know is that that range is up to a month. So that can mean around Thanksgiving and as late as late in January, she could give birth. Are you able to determine the gender since she's so close to giving birth? So we have not been able to see um, any gonads for to tell you if it was a male or a female, but is it possible if we got the right view? Yes. How did you get involved with this project in the first place? So Michigan State and Potter Park Zoo has a good relationship as far as we collaborate on different cases and different species. And Dr. Carlton is actually the person who introduced me to Dr. Ronan. And so we've seen a, a variety of species. I've actually been here to help um, inseminate some of the heifers. So we're waiting to see if they're pregnant. And so we work out here on a weekly to monthly basis, learning different things about species. And Dr. Ronan also collaborates with us so that we can learn and he can learn. So we know things, for example, I'm, my background is equine. Um, and so there are things that I know. We just were walking over talking about the cecum of the horse. And so he's learning from me and I'm certainly learning from him. How does your experience with equine translate to Dopsy's pregnancy? So in practice, I was um, a general practitioner in equine um, in Michigan and um, now back doing primary care work and doing my alternate residency. And so things that I can correlate to is there's a little fetus inside of her and there's a lot of similar things when we look at bony structures on an ultrasound, regardless if it's a horse, a cow, a cat, or a dog, there's all features that we're looking for and for the health of the pregnancy, regardless of species. Um, with Dopsy, she is similar to horse in some ways. Um, and so like today we were talking about parturition and getting prepared and what sort of supplies we may need. And those things correlate amongst different large animals, cows, horses, etc. We're also here with Dr. Carlton. Dr. Carlton, can you tell us about your experience with Dopsy's pregnancy? I've been involved with uh, Dopsy's pregnancy as well as other rhino pregnancies and some other exotic, exotic species that I have been working with since in, in zoo work since 1981. So this is just a continuation of other zoo work that I've been doing. What are different things that you've learned throughout Dopsy's pregnancy? One of the things that's been quite curious is normally on an early ultrasound of a horse, because the species have some similarities, is you'd be able to look at the, the uterine horns via trans, transrectal ultrasound and see that early pregnancy. And with Dopsies, we've been able to see the tips of the uterine horns, but that area where the, the uterine horns converge at the uterine body on the midline at the middle of the pregnancy seemed to have taken a really steep dive at a much earlier stage of pregnancy than we'd see in the horse, which has made it more difficult to track the pregnancy transrectally compared to the horse. So we ran into a, a portion of her exam where we could find the tips of the horns. We could find nothing of the pregnancy whatsoever. But as we started farther along in the pregnancy to the point that we could see structures transabdominally, we've been able to do a much better job of, a much better job of tracking the fetal parts and looking at ribs and spinal column, the amnion, the placental membranes, and actually even the lining of the uterine wall with some infolding. And that infolding or that redundancy happens as the placenta develops because you need additional uterine attachment space for enough placenta to sustain a pregnancy to term. Speaking of horns, that got me thinking about, you know, rhinos have horns after they've matured. Do they grow these horns also while they're in gestation during a pregnancy or how does that all work? 
So at, at the time of, of birth, you're going to have the, the bony structures of the head or the skull of the neonate where you'll see where the horns will develop, but clearly they don't develop in utero during parturition. That would make it a little bit dangerous or iffy for mom during birth. So those you'll see evidence of where they're going to develop, but they won't be present at the time of birth. But they come along you know, fairly quickly after that within the first year or two of life. You'll start seeing difference differences in those growth of structures. What features have you seen that have been developed already within the fetus that you saw today in the ultrasound? Uh, both spinal column, rib cages, we saw some more evidence of placental thickness along the uterine wall. We had, again, some of the nice redundancies of that, uh, of the uterine wall itself, and had some other very good images of the amion. amnion. And then one of the things we've got a first really good glimpse of today was the biparietal diameter, which is, again, looking at the size of the head of the fetus. And the size of the fetus as it develops is of particular interest because when we've done our transrectal exams, we know how big the pelvic space is, the birth canal through which the fetus has to pass. And then if you had an overly large fetus, that could be problematic. So far, everything seems right on track. So the size of the fetus should not have any difficulty passing through the birth canal. Whenever she's giving birth, is someone going to be there with her to pull out the fetus, or does she do it completely by herself? The things that we can do with domestic species are in a completely different realm when you're looking at exotic species and animals that even as tolerant as Dopsy is for all of our exams and as accepting of the procedures, and that truly is a testimony to the veterinarian here, Dr. Ronan, as well as the keepers who are just the heroes in this entire thing, that when it comes time uh, for Dopsy to give birth, we have a camera set up now in the stalls that is, is great detailed for that, and we have a monitor that is far enough out of her line of view that we can actually monitor her as she approaches term. And, uh, and by being able to actually see those, those images, uh, we'll have people as she gets close to term, mammary development has enlarged, so we know she's close to producing milk. We'll, we'll see some evidence of colostrum, that first milk that's essential for the neonate. We'll have that evidence. But when she actually starts to give birth, the critical thing is you're not going to dive in the stall. You're not going to be able to provide the assistance with the vaginal deliveries you could do with the domestic species. So the critical thing is that she's observed, and if indeed we have any delays at all or if it seems it's going badly, then we'll have to go to a general anesthesia and assist with delivery. So we hope that's not the case. The term that's appropriately used for her is primiparis. It means it's her first pregnancy. So she's never given birth before. She's never had, therefore, a baby at her side. And so when you have a neonate, the critical thing is, is she's going to give birth normally, which we hope, and if we have a normal neonate at her side, will she accept it? And that's another critical thing that, since it's a new factor, a new experience for her, our, really, our good hopes are that her kind personality and the way she takes everything else so calmly will also relate to her being a good mom and very accepting of the neonate. Stage one is that birth takes place. It's there in the stall. We hope she'll let it uh, continue living and not get stomped on or injured in any way. But the more critical thing is, then will she allow it to nurse? And so again, the other thing the keepers are doing that's really essential is as we're examining her transabdominally, we're also touching her mammary gland, we're touching the teats of the mammary gland and getting them used to touch so when the, the neonate stands up and nurses and, and suckles for the first time, she'll tolerate it without having any issues with that and hopefully not reject it. Since embryos are pretty tiny comparatively for a large size animal, especially a rhino, how are you able to tell in the first place that Dopsy was pregnant anyways? Well, it, it goes back to a little bit farther than that than the early pregnancy. It's the time of actually breeding. So the rhinos have a really interesting cycle so when she is in a cyclic phase having an estrous cycle she'll have a, a short time when she is actually receptive to the male so we have a lot of videotape at the time of her first cycle on which she didn't get pregnant and we were watching her activity and Phineas is the name of their male and Phineas would approach her and she let him know in no uncertain terms that not now and they actually tipped her one horn because they said when rhinos are breeding, it can be very violent. And, and she usually hooks them with her horn and, and as a means of saying, get away. 
And so they tipped the horn and they said, you don't worry about it unless it seems arterial because you'll expect the male to come up a little bit bloody during the, the breeding process. So he actually covered her and did a what we call a live cover, a natural breeding on one cycle. And then what you're looking for is you're tracking progesterone, one of the hormones of pregnancy, and you're watching to see if that is, is at a normal level. If she's coming back in heat, it will drop. If she's pregnant, it stays elevated. And in that first instance, we knew within a few days of sending off the blood samples that she was not pregnant. And that was the earliest indicator that she wasn't pregnant. She came back in heat again. And so we had another live cover, live breeding by Phineas to Dopsy. And the progesterone level stayed elevated. We can't do the early checks as much as we do in horses sometimes at 15 or 16 days. Some people do it even earlier than that. And it was after that point when the progesterone stayed elevated that we then continued on with our transrectal palpation and ultrasound and first saw evidence of the pregnancy itself. As a final question, Dr. Carlton, why is Dopsy's pregnancy so important? Well, for me, it's a, a matter of recognizing that the loss of a species that's as charismatic and as interesting as Dopsy is with the black rhinos in their, their small numbers, that we do everything we can to try to preserve them. I mean, she's really extraordinary anyway, but that loss of that that species to me would be rather sad. One of the realities in, in the zoo world is that you have to have some charismatic species that can actually help bring in money and attention from the public so that we can actually maintain other species that might be less interesting to other people. Biodiversity is essential for the planet, and to me, Dopsy is just part of that. The species survival plan that is really managed by the zoo world is absolutely critical to look at the genetic material and diversity to make sure that we have good breeding of animals that can maintain the best of the best and, and of a species that I think is, is really critical to what we're really losing in the world right now. We're not doing a very good job of managing the only home we have, which is Mother Earth. You know, it's like we've got to do better, and she's a part of that plan. Thank you, Dr. Carlton, for all that insight for the work that you're involved with when it comes to Dopsy's pregnancy. Next, we have Dr. Ronan, and he'll give us a little bit of an introduction to his role with Dopsy's pregnancy now. So yeah, my name's uh, Dr. Ronan Eustis. I'm the director of animal health for uh, Potter Park Zoo. So I'm the sole veterinarian at the zoo. Um, so I take care of the coordinating the medical care for all the animals at the zoo. Um, also, I help coordinate research. Um, you know, so when someone applies for doing research at the zoo, I'll help evaluate the study to make sure it's appropriate. Um, yeah, so for Dopsy, she's part of the collection. So she's one of the animals that um, I help take care of from a medical point of view. So just like how a human female will go to her ob and get routine checks throughout her pregnancy, we do the same thing with the animal. You mentioned that there are research projects here at the zoo. Are there currently any research projects going on with Dopsy and her pregnancy? Yeah, so she's um, part of an ongoing study uh, that's being led by Dr. Monica Stoops, who's a reproductive specialist based out of Omaha Zoo. Also, she collaborates with Denver Zoo and with CREW, which is the Center for Research of Endangered Wildlife, which is based out of Cincinnati Zoo. And she's the lead researcher on any rhino reproduction topic. And so we draw blood on Dopsy once a week through... Um, voluntary trained behavior so Dopsy goes into a chute and allows us to draw blood from her awake and we some of the blood will submit to her to monitor her progesterone levels and uh, she's working with a researcher based out of UC Davis veterinary school to determine a test that will actually say what stage of gestation what date of gestation um, a black rhino would be based on a single blood sample. How do scientists and veterinarians come up with a scheme to determine which rhinos are relevant for breeding with each other and which ones would have the best outcomes for the pregnancy? So all the endangered species at the zoo are part of a species survival plan, and the species survival plan has a, a stud book coordinator who works with uh, the population management center based out of Lincoln Park Zoo, where those are PhDs who basically say this individual is the least genetically related to this individual and uh, they'll model the population and they'll say we should breed this individual with this individual and then they'll talk to the stud book coordinator who will then 
tell the different zoos and say, you breed this one with this, this other individual to try to maximize the, the genetic diversity. So all these populations we're trying to, our goal is to be sustainable over a hundred year period and to maintain 95% genetic diversity. That being said, current AZA, most current AZA SSP populations aren't sustainable because um, it's just challenging. And so we're actually in what's called a sustainability crisis right now when we look at all the different AZA populations. And so we're trying to figure out how are we managing these species and if we can do it better. For a species like the black rhino, it's challenging because there's only about 60 in captivity. And if you think about those 60 in captivity, you're going to have probably 30 who are female. Some are going to be post-reproductive. Some are going to be pre-reproductive. Some might have never bred before. Um, so it's challenging with those low numbers to actually be sustainable. Um, so the assisted reproductive technologies and the, the more information we can get on normal black rhino reproduction so we can maximize being able to breed these individuals in captive it, it is key. It's just key. So, Can you please define what is AZA? So um, it's an association of zoo and aquariums. So there's about, I don't know, approximately 10,000 exotic animal uh, dealers, zoo, you know, farm type things with exotic animals in the U.S. And they're all regulated by USDA. AZA is a a subset, it's uh, about 200, in, 200 zoos or aquariums, um, and they have a higher accreditation standard, um, much higher standards than, say, uh, what the USDA uh, uh, regulations are. So every five years to be part of the AZA, you have a team of inspectors from different zoos come out, and they go through everything. So I'm an inspector. I go and do it, and, uh, you know, we look at finances, uh, we look at um, guest services, we look at the animal care, we look at their, do they have an animal welfare program, do they have a veterinary program, do they have uh, good maintenance um, programs. It's com comprehensive because, again, if you fall down in any of those areas, the animal care suffers. And I, I, um, yeah, so, and do they have good scientific research or scientific advancement? Those are all different categories. There's about 13 different categories. So to be part of the AZA, you know, um, as an, an inspector, when I come out and assess them, if they're, um, you know, they're, they're reapplying for their accreditation and they're not publishing scientific articles or if the vet staff or the animal care staff isn't publishing scientific data, if they're not collaborating with zoos or other researchers, that would be something they could, you know, potentially lose their accreditation for. So it's a, it's a subset of zoos and we're, we're trying to do best practices. And, uh, and again, to be part of the SSP, the Species Survival Plan, you have to be part of AZA in general. Thanks for that comprehensive view of the AZA. Back to the genetic diversity that we were discussing. If Dopsy had not worked out well with Phineas, what would have happened since there are not that many options out there? Like, can a rhino be artificially inseminated? Yes. Um, not every species of rhino has successfully had artificial insemination. So again, when you're doing any of these assisted reproductive techniques, there's a lot of background scientific data that you have to have ahead of time. And Dopsy's partake in some of those studies so just nor learning what a normal estrus cycle is in a, a black rhino is sort of the first step um, when you think about assisted reproduction assisted reproductive techniques like artificial insemination um, in a human right you have to do it at a certain point in that person's cycle to have success and the same thing's true in a black rhino uh, or any species so usually it's a phd project first to get the the first you know what is a normal black rhino uh, estrus cycle is the first thing and then you have to find out what drugs you can use to synchronize the estrus cycle and you have to see if those will work in that species so there's a lot of basic science that goes into it before you start um, trying even assisted artificial insemination um, just tons of it and people like uh, Mon Dr. Monica Stoops um, the crew with the Center for Research for Endangered Wildlife Omaha Zoo has a reproductive there's there's a few different um, research collaborative groups um, based at different zoos that are doing this basic science and uh, and it's it's really really key. Lastly we're here with Pat Fountain. Pat what has been your interaction with Dopsy and your experiences? So I started out here as a zookeeper and um, I've been with Dopsy literally since the day she got here. So she came here the beginning of June 2011 and I've been working with her for about six years or seven years after that and then my job title changed a little bit and I'm the animal care supervisor so I oversee all the animals and all the keepers, but I still make time out of my day to go see Dopsy whenever I can. What's the difference between your role and the role of a veterinarian? Um, my role is much more of a day-to-day -day animal husbandry type role to make sure that Dopsy's needs are getting met on a cleaning, feeding, and observation scale. 
When watching Dopsy get the ultrasound, I realized that she really is a very nice rhino. She interacts with the keepers so well. Like You can call Dopsy and she will come to the keepers, which is better than what I can say for my own cats. How were you able to basically train a rhino? Like, how do you train a rhino? It starts very early. Um, as soon as the rhino gets here, we try to spend as much time as possible with them to gain their trust and to find out what they react to. Luckily for us, Dopsy loves treats. She's never met a treat she doesn't like. So to get her to do a behavior, all it took was a little bit of time and patience and some delicious treats. Uh, we started off by training her simple things like Target, where you ask her just to come touch her nose to something and then she gets her favorite piece of produce. Maybe it's an apple or a carrot or a sweet potato. And then we moved on to more difficult things like training her for blood draws, where she trained, she's trained to place a foot on a block so the vet staff can draw blood from the opposite leg. Or eventually, we did start training her for rectal ultrasounds well before we even had a male, so we'd be prepared for a day like today. Speaking of treats, what is Dopsy's favorite treat anyways? Her absolute favorite treat, and I can only say it because uh, the vet isn't listening anymore, is uh, mints. So if you give her a little star mint, uh, just like you or I would like, she'll roll it around in her mouth and then she'll crunch on it and you can hear her eating it and it makes her really happy. She'll come to the crinkle of a wrapper because she knows what that means. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we do limit the amount of sugar she gets. So she gets two carrots, two apples, and a large sweet potato um, for training and or enrichment every day. And then she also gets alfalfa cubes like you'd give to a horse or something like that. She likes that a lot too. Daniel and I have been to Potter Park Zoo many times. For example, we've been here whenever you've hosted an event where different animals are doing enrichment activities. What are some enrichment activities that Dopsy partakes in? Uh, for the rhinos, we do a couple different uh, types of enrichment every day for them. It's really important for us when we have an animal that large to keep them motivated to move around, to do things that would be natural for their behavior, things that they would do if she was in Africa. So we may take a branch and hang it up high for her because black rhinos are browsers. They like branches and leaves. Um, it's good for her muscle tone and for her behavior to be reaching up and eating. So we've also recently installed uh, hay mangers that are up off of the ground because it's typical to feed them on the ground. But after talking to other rhino professionals, we realized that the best thing for them would to be mimicking their natural behavior where they would reach up to grab things. So a lot of it is trying to find different ways to make them do the things they would do in the wild. Other than that, in the mornings, we do something called contra freeloading, which is a type of enrichment that means that she gets her food and her breakfast presented in a different way every single day. That will just give her um, a little more time to figure out what she's doing, to find her food maybe, um, to just get used to it presented in different ways, to occupy her time while we're doing things like cleaning the yard because we don't like to leave her inside for too long without keeping her busy. Otherwise, sometimes she lays down and doesn't want to get up for the rest of the day. How has Dopsy's diet changed since she's become pregnant anyways? Her diet stays remarkably the same. She gets about four kilograms of grain split between two feedings a day, and she gets between seven to ten flakes of hay, depending on how she how much she's eating for the day. Um, she also gets browse whenever we have it available. We actually uh, freeze browse so we can feed it over the winter time. Sometimes we'll actually store... Um, if we have a really good load of wood chips, we'll store them and freeze them because it's really good for their digestive system and for their teeth too. And we'll actually give her big sticks. If you think of like um, a bone or like a greeny bone for your dogs, that's good for their dental. Um, same thing. If we get a big willow stick that's a couple inches in diameter, you give it to the rhinos and they'll just chew on it for days. They also get a lot of different um, supplements in their diet every day because it's not possible to mimic the diet of a African rhino here in Michigan. So things like progesterone or linpro amino acids and um, a whole array of different um, supplements goes on top of their food on a daily basis. Vitamin E is another big one. And a lot of that has to do with skin condition and just overall health. You brought up a good point that Dopsy is a African black rhino and we're here in Michigan. How does the weather and this climate and just being in Michigan affect her since her body's made for Africa? It's very different. She does enjoy the snow. So when she is outside in the snow, she will do this thing where uh, if it's a nice day, say, you know, in the 30s and we have some nice fluffy snow and no ice, we'll let her out in our off exhibit yard and she'll actually put her head all the way down the snow and throw snow in the air and then just run around. And she'll play outside for like 10 or 15 minutes before she gets too cold and then she comes inside. For the most part, she adapts pretty well. We do give her access to the barn a lot. And in the wintertime, she is inside for most of it. Not, like I said, not so much for the snow because she does enjoy going out in the snow, but if it's icy at all, we can't risk her running around outside and hurting herself. 
How often do the female and male rhino interact outside of the breeding process? Black rhinos are solitary animals. They only come together to breed. And what typically happens is a male will be walking around and he'll find a big pile of poop. And he'll smell it and he'll say, oh, there's a girl around here. I should probably find her. She smells like she's going to be in the heat soon. Then he goes and finds her and she beats him up. And she chases him away. And this will go on for three or four days where he keeps smelling it. He keeps following her from as closely as he can and he'll approach her. And then eventually, as she comes in the heat, the hormones that he smells in the feces will get him very excited and she'll become more receptive until eventually he's chasing her around and then she'll stop and they'll breed maybe for a day or two and then they'll go their separate ways again. So here at the zoo, we try to mimic that as much as possible. We give them access to each other's poop, basically. Um, we'll leave it in the yards if they're switching yards so they can smell it and they can know that the other one's around. We try to leave as much of the uh, urine uh, that we can inside because that's actually really good for them. It's kind of counterintuitive for someone who cleans up after animals all day to leave some dirt and grime, but it's better for the animals overall. So we do we do, do that as well. Whenever the calf is born, what are you going to do about the calf? Is the calf going to stay with her? And if so, for how long? So calf will stay with mom for between two to four years. And that depends largely on one mom's tolerance of the calf. As it gets older, she may get tired of having it around. That does happen and they don't show wean it sooner. Or if mom's ready to breed again, they'll usually wean around the two year mark. If she's not in a breeding situation and we're not pushing her to breed or there's not a recommendation or whatnot, the baby can actually stay with mom for about four years. Well, thank you everyone for coming in today to talk about what your role is with Dopsy's pregnancy and allowing us to come view the ultrasound for her pregnancy. It was a really enriching experience for both Chelsea and I, and we really do appreciate it. Thanks again to everyone here at Potter Park Zoo and MSU. If you are curious about Dopsy or anything else happening at Potter Park, or if you're also interested in donating, you can go to potterparkzoo.org. Thank you to all of our listeners that joined us this week. And remember, the truth is in the science. Any comments and questions can be directed to scifiles at impact89fm.org. We'll see you all next week on Scifiles.